My guest is Dr. Kayla Daniel, and uh, she is known as the naughty nutritionist because she tells the truth that's too hot to handle. And we've had a great time talking about some of the things that she recommends to have a healthy diet. But we're going to talk about a controversial topic now, which is soy. Uh, Soy has been painted as the end all and be all in some respects. And in others, it's been painted as this is the worst thing you could ever put in your body. So you talk about practicing safe soy. Tell us what that means. I am often thought to be an anti-soy person, but the truth is I enjoy miso soup. I enjoy a little natto once in a while, a little tempeh, some of the traditional soy products that uh, have been used for many years in in Asia. But uh, there are many modern soy products that people are using, consuming to excess, things like soy milk, uh, soy energy bars, soy shake powders, and um, all the fake meats, the the soy loins and the sham hams and all of the all of the fake 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 meat products made out of soy. Those are the things I have the most concern about. And so there's a big difference between small quantities of old fashioned whole soy products and some of the modern modern inventions. So that's something I think people need to think about. But I would caution that that there are people who are allergic to soy and for them all soy should be avoided. And for them, it is such a challenge because soy is in everything. It's in more than 70 percent of uh, processed products and just about everything that comes in a package or you buy at a restaurant. Soy is very challenging. So uh, I really have a lot of sympathy for the many, many people who are developing soy allergies And yes, soy allergies have increased dramatically since the first GMO soy came on the market. So that's another issue that if people do want to eat soy, despite the warnings that I want to give about some of the problems, they should definitely seek out organic soy products because the genetically modified soy products are much, much worse, both for us personally in terms of our health and in terms of the environment. So very, very important to go organic. Yeah, that's interesting because I had no idea soy was in so many products. Well, you'd be amazed. It's in things like bumblebee canned tuna and like why. (laughs) Years ago, if soy was added to a product, it was considered something that was cheapening the product. And it was something that people had to eat in poor countries like Cuba or Russia or uh, if you were an old hippie. It, it, it had a real image problem, but the soy industry was absolutely brilliant that they came up with the idea that the way to sell soy would be to make it an upscale product that was a health food. And they were absolutely brilliant in turning around people's idea about soy like where before it had a serious image problem, poverty consciousness, uh, many, many things wrong with it. But now a whole lot of people believe it's going to be healthy, that it's going to prevent everything from heart disease to cancer. And in fact, the research is very mixed and um, it can actually cause, contribute to and accelerate the growth of many cancers. It can cause certain kinds of heart problems. And because of that, the FDA is actually finally retracting the health claim it first allowed in 1999. So that's that's huge. The FDA does not usually retract themselves on anything. I'm very surprised. Yeah, I remember that. Um, I remember that they they said that soy products were good uh, to prevent cancer. And then I went to a lecture somewhere, and that person said no. Uh, it, it helped cause cancer. Of course, I think there's so many things they don't know and it changes. This is good one time and it's not good another. But uh, what about helping women go through menopause? Is it a safe and effective remedy for that? Well, that's an interesting question because it does seem to help some women with symptoms. But the downside is we've got more than 70 years of research indicating that it's going to damage your thyroid. 
So I don't think that's a good trade-off. And so many women uh, in their midlife years are already experiencing lethargy, fatigue, weight gain, malaise, loss of libido, and other things. They go to their doctors, and the doctor says, well, you're, you're going through menopause. What do you expect? And if your thyroid is down, and many, many people have, have thyroids that are, are hypo or under-functioning, and soy will actually make that worse. And the research on that is extremely compelling, very consistent. So, um, you know, I, I just don't think it's almost, you look at things, I don't even know if you dare put anything in your mouth anymore because there's so <laughs> many, so many rules. Um, but yet Asians eat a lot of soy and they seem to be very healthy. Well, actually, I would challenge that uh, in a couple ways. Like, first of all, Asia is a huge continent with many different people and dietary customs. So it's different in different parts of China. It's different in Japan, Korea, uh, Vietnam, and so forth. Uh, but wherever we look at the soy and the diet in Asia, we discover that traditionally it was used as a condiment in the diet and not as a staple food. So yes, eating small amounts perhaps every day, but we're talking very small amounts and that's very different from drinking several glasses of soy milk, uh, soy shakes, soy energy bars, uh, tofu as uh, say a whole slab, like a steak size, as opposed to a few little cubes in some soup. So a very different consumption pattern. The other thing is traditionally the soy in Asia would be things like natto, uh, tempeh, uh, tofu, miso soup, and hard to excessively consume those products. I mean, natto has such a strong smell and stuff that uh, many restaurants in Asia, they will actually have separate rooms for the people who eat natto, you know, keep them apart from the rest of the diners. I don't even know what that is. I've never even heard of that. Well, it's a foul smelling fermented soy product that actually is very healthy for us. It's full of K2, one of the highest sources, uh, but it is definitely an acquired taste. And you're not going to have a problem eating too much natto. It's just not going to happen. And likewise with tempeh, if you have a little in a stir fry, it's, it's very hard to eat that excessively. Miso soup, I can have a whole cup in the morning and it's just a teaspoon. So that's not the same issue as people consuming things like uh, soy milk. And you might think because soy milk can be made in your own kitchen that it's a traditional product, but in fact it was not traditional in Asia. It came in with Seventh-day Adventist missionaries from America who were trying to help many of the starving children and babies. And um, they started to promote the production of soy milk in Asia. So not really a traditional product at all. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. So you mentioned before that, that um, the FDA retracted its soy health claim and why did they do that and do they you said they rarely take anything back so why did they do this well i can actually take some credit for that because some years ago i was uh, i wrote a petition a really long involved petition with all the research and some top scientists signed it along with me and uh, it was filed by the Weston Price Foundation and uh, the FDA basically sat, sat on it for years. They were legally supposed to act, but nothing was happening. And then when they were trying to get a soy prevents cancer health claim besides the soy prevents heart disease health claim, got a petition out um, telling them not to accept that. And we actually won on that. So the soy industry had thought that they would increase their sales substantially because when they went from under uh, under a billion a year to four billion a year in sales after the heart claim went through, they wanted to do something similar with the cancer claim. It was going to convince a whole lot of people to eat soy who otherwise would not eat soy. 
So they were pretty much forced to retract that whole cancer prevention claim. And now they're losing the heart heart prevention claim. So victory here. So where where the only thing I really know that that um, vegetarian, et cetera, is tofu. Where does tofu fit on all of this? Well, the way I see tofu is it is a whole soy product and it is traditional. In Asia, traditionally, it was used in small quantities. In fact, where they use the most tofu would be in the monasteries because the, the, the monks started to notice that when tofu consumption went up, the naughty behavior went down. So tofu had quite a reputation for being an aid for celibacy. So, and, and Japanese wives, uh, if they've got an unfaithful husband, will give him extra helpings of tofu so that he'll... <laughs> <laughs> so he won't stray, huh? <laughs> yeah, he'll lose the ability or the desire or both. <laughs> That's amazing, amazing. Because I know that my, um, on my, uh, my sister's kids, her daughter and her granddaughter and grandson, they're all vegetarian and they eat a lot of tofu. And, um, and you're saying it's packed full of soy. Oh yes, it's, it's soy, it's definitely soy. And I wanna be clear, I, I enjoy a little tofu once in a while, a vegetarian potluck or even in my own house, I make it with shiitake mushrooms, absolutely delicious, but it is an occasional thing. And I do not have thyroid problems or infertility issues or any of the reasons that one might be careful about soy consumption. Wow. Unbelievable. Okay. Well, it's good to know. Um, so I guess I would ask you, um, well, first I want to ask you about Dr. Oz. What was it like being on Dr. Oz's show? It was wonderful. Uh, he has a small audience of 100 people or so, very enthusiastic people, um, and it's so much fun. And uh, Dr. Oz is fun, and I was with Dr. Mark Hyman. Uh, we had a wonderful conversation about soy. Uh, we basically reached an agreement about, uh, you know, small quantities of old-fashioned soy products are absolutely fine. And Dr. Hyman and Dr. Oz and I all agreed that we're, our concerns were with the soy shake powders and the energy bars and the fake this and the fake that. So it was, it was just a very fun experience. Wow. Well, you know, I, uh, you you can tell that you, I mean, you've studied this from A to Z, Kayla, and you, you are a wealth of information. Uh, but I also think it's very difficult for most people to eat this way. So give me an idea of Kayla's day. What do you eat in a day? Well, I get up and I will make some kind of egg dish, often eggs with some vegetables, and uh, perhaps uh, some quinoa or something that might be left over. I'm not necessarily cooking from scratch with every meal. There's a certain amount of uh, preparing ahead, should we say. But a typical breakfast will be some eggs, um, maybe some bacon from pastured pigs, um, delicious healthy bacon as opposed to say a supermarket bacon. So start the eggs, start the day with eggs, um, some sauerkraut, good old fashioned sauerkraut, genuine fermented product, helping my digestion, helping me, you know, to refresh my probiotics, uh, keep my microbiome and my gut healthy. So that is typically breakfast. I will often have a cup of broth, either broth I've made myself or that I bought from Flavor Chef, my favorite brand there. And uh, for lunch, it might be something like, say, say a salad with, with some chicken, uh, might be a soup in the winter, often soup and salad, um, uh, beef stew, different beef stews, um, different different meats I do well with a fair amount of meat in my diet and you know dinner would be something similar stir fry vegetables so I'm basically focusing on meat and vegetables and high quality some grains but I am gluten-free 
So the grains that I would include, some rice, some quinoa, gluten-free things. And uh, when I go out to restaurants, I do seek out the ones that have gluten-free options. I eat out occasionally and try to focus on high quality. Well, you know, the reason I'm asking is I know that I met you in a hotel. And when you stay in a hotel, I'm assuming you don't bring your own food. Maybe you do. I know some people do. Uh, So when you go to a hotel restaurant, what do you eat? Well, when we met in Atlanta, I was very blessed because one block away, there was a farm to table restaurant and I was there all the time. I spent quite a lot of money, actually, but it was such a treat. It was very, very special and a nice, quiet restaurant where I could uh, recharge uh, needed needed that quiet and, and the extra energy. And I do bring uh, or buy some groceries uh, like hard boiled eggs, things like that, so that I can have breakfast in my hotel room because I just prefer the quiet early on to start my day. Interesting. Wow. So give us an idea because this is a show for women 50 plus. Uh, Give us an idea how your life has changed or what you're doing over 50 that you didn't do under 50 and have you always been in this nutritionist uh, work and uh, what do you say or what is some of your advice for women 50 plus? Well I went to get my PhD in nutrition when I was 50 and got my PhD when I was 54 And at the time, my mother said, why would you do this at your advanced age? And it was... (laughs) Advanced age, I love it. Well, of course, you know, when when your mom was 50, 50 was old, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so that's interesting. I had another guest, and she didn't do her um, doctorate until she was, I think, uh, 50 as well. So, um, So here we have a couple of people who are now doing their doctorates at 50. And uh, I think that's great. And that's our listeners need to know it's just never too late. You can do what you want to do no matter what your age. Okay, so go ahead. You start, you got the doctorate. Yeah, it's never too late. And, you know, we adult learners, we're paying for it ourselves. So we're very focused. (laughs) Right, exactly. But the reason I decided to get a PhD in nutritional sciences when I was 50 was because for many years I'd been sick and tired and I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. I tried every diet that was out there. I tried veganism and live food combining and Ayurvedic and traditional Chinese medicine and juicing. I tried everything and didn't start to get really well until I found a traditional diet, omnivorous diet that includes um, many, many foods that are, that are animal products. So I, once I had that knowledge and started to regain my health and energy, I really wanted to work in that field and share what I'd learned and make it accessible to people. And that's where that naughty nutritionist comes in because people are sick and tired of all of the contradictory, inconsistent dietary advice. They're overwhelmed. And I just try to make it fun and good, good information, education plus entertainment. So what did you do in your, the first part of your life? I grew up on a farm, but it was a farm where there was pesticide use, so I was exposed to a lot of that as I was growing up, and grew up in a family where where there was a lot of pressure to uh, to succeed, to be perfect, and that can be that can be rough. And I started out in music, and then I became an art critic, tried various things, and my health problems were really holding me back in all of those fields, and eventually uh, developed this new passion for, for nutrition and traditional cultures and learning, and, and that's what I'm doing now. Wow. So how do you work with people? Tell me, how do people work with you? Do they hire you to work with them individually? Do you go into companies? Uh, What do you do? I mostly work with clients one-to-one and I work with people from all over the world. One of the wonders of father technology is we have Skype, we have Zoom, we have ways to look at each other face-to-face. 
So I can be talking to somebody in Norway and the, the biggest problem is figuring out the time zones. So I can work with people wherever they live and we can do lab work uh, wherever they live. And um, it, it's a real pleasure to do that. And I spend a lot of time with people because it's never just about food. There's lifestyle, there's, there's uh, relationships, there's just, just many things. And some of the prescriptions have to do with, with getting out and having fun. It's, it's never just about the perfect diet. So how would you like people to get in touch with you? Do you want them to go to your website? Do you want them to uh, email you? Do you want them to call you? What would be the best way for listeners who are interested in talking to you further about uh, your viewpoints on certain things and possibly helping them? What would be the best way for them to get in touch with you? Uh, the website, drkayladaniel.com, and there's a little pop-up, and people can set up an appointment, and we can uh, talk for free to just get to know each other. And if it feels like a good match, we can go forward. Okay, and remember, that's Kayla with two A's. Uh, Dr. Kayla, K-A-A-Y-L-A, daniel.com, correct? That's right. And I love working with women over 50. Uh I, you know, that's, that's my, that's my age. Well, I'm 67 now. So, so working with people in, in this age group and helping us all stay very energetic and on purpose for life is what I'm after. Well, that's the point. I mean, um, I'm older than you are and I have so much energy and I, I, I mean, I, I do sleep well and I need my sleep. I'm not going to say I don't. But I do work out all the time and I do uh, love what I do. And I must say that I have a lot more energy than people half my age. So I feel good about that. Although I don't always um, eat the kinds of foods you're telling me to eat, Kayla. So I've got to tell you that. But I think people would really benefit by getting to know you, uh, working with you, hearing your knowledge uh, and understanding what their particular issues are. And I'm sure that by doing, you're saying, you mentioned blood work. I'm sure by doing blood work, there's a lot of uh, answers that are given to you. Is that right? Yes, and there's other kinds of testing too that are even less invasive. Um, uh, there's, there's saliva testing, there's um, blood spot testing where you don't have to go for a whole blood draw where you can do it at home. Uh, there's hair mineral analysis where we can uh, learn a lot from from what's in your hair. So there's there's many ways we can test uh, that are are more alternative, say, than a standard doctor. That's fabulous. That's great. Well, gosh, um, we have about two minutes left. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you want our audience to know? I think it all comes back to how common sense has become uncommon. <laughs> so, <laughs> true, true. <laughs> so, uh, if a, you know, we keep hearing we want miracle foods and quick fixes, it rarely works that way. <laughs> So slow and steady, um, go in the right direction. We don't have to be perfect, but we do have to move in the right direction on a regular basis, I think. Well, you're not wrong there, that's for sure. Well, I hope you folks that have been listening to this understand the deep knowledge that Dr. Kayla has and the fact that uh, she's very passionate about what she does and the fact that, you know, she's, she's doing this and she's 67 years old and she um, is very happy and very enthusiastic and very uh, energetic and lives the way she wants to live. She goes to a, a, a location, she goes to a hotel, she finds a restaurant that caters to what she wants. She carries some food with her. I mean, these are all doable things. So if you're interested in learning more, go to her website, which is Dr. Kayla, K-A-A-Y-L-A, Daniel, D-A-N-I-E-L dot com. See what she has, set up an appointment with her and find out about yourself. I want to thank you so much for being with us today, Kayla. And hopefully our listeners learned a great deal and will be able to take advantage of your knowledge. 
Thank you. It's been a lot of fun, Gail.